If you all couldn't already tell, I'm very interested in race and how we classify ourselves. And a film that I was introduced to very young was The Imitation of Life. If you're unfamiliar with the film, please do watch it. I would even go so far to say it's required viewing before you listen to today's video. But nonetheless, quick synopsis. The Imitation of Life is about a black woman, a dark-skinned black woman who has a mixed-race child and her child can pass for a white woman. And, you know, they go through some hard shit, blah, blah, blah. And the dark-skinned black woman, who was the mother of this mixed-race child, ends up building a successful business and empire selling, can you guess it? Can you guess it? I just said she's a dark-skinned black woman who builds a successful empire. Ooh, I, I. Basically, she's Aunt Jemima. <laughs> and she sells syrup. But that's a really quick synopsis of the story. The key takeaway that I want you guys to focus on here is the fact that this dark-skinned woman has a child who can pass for white and what that means and the legacy that that has left behind. But today's video is not about the legacy of the imitation of life. Today's video is about octoroons, creoles, and a history lesson. If you're unfamiliar with what an octoroon is, an octoroon is a mixed race person who is one eighth black. And we don't talk about the legacy of the Octoroon enough and actually how the legacy of the Octoroon has created the Creole. And what we're going to use for today's video to sort of be our launching pad is an essay written by Joe Wood, originally published December 6, 1994, Escape from Blackness, Once Upon a Time in Creole America. Now, this essay is extremely important. You can find it online at The Village Voice. You can also read along with me, which is why I'm telling you where to go find it. And before we get into this and respond to this essay, I want you guys to one, know that I identify, I self-identify as a Black woman. I am a dark-skinned Black woman. And yes, like most Black people in America, I too <laughs> have white ancestry, and it doesn't go back, you know, a hundred generations. Mm -mm. My great-great-grandfather was half white, and his grandfather was a full white man. So, you know, history. And, you know, with saying all of that, I absolutely do not pass for white. No, my father is blackity biggity biggity black <laughs> biggity biggity black from Grenada. But my mother is light-skinned, much lighter than I am. And often growing up, people didn't believe that my mother was my mother. So, let's dig in. New Orleans. It was late and the show was finished. We were hungry and drunk. Adolph said Mules was probably closed by now, but he knew a place to eat on the other side of town. Maybe you'll see some of them over there, too, he said. Adolph is a scholar of African-American history and politics, and he was raised in New Orleans and knew how they looked and where they ate. They like Mules, a Seventh Ward diner that serves the best oyster rolls in the city. The other place, Adolph said was also good for observations, but far below the Seventh Ward culinary standards. It turned out to be an all-night fast food joint, lighted too brightly with a listless crowd of party people waiting in broken lines for some uninspired fried fare. For a moment, I forgot entirely about them and they. I wanted to try an oyster roll, but there were none left. So I ordered a chicken sandwich dressed with lettuce and tomato and mayonnaise. The woman at the cash register seemed bored by my enthusiasm and sighed, and in response, I noted her skin color. She was dark. I turned my head and checked out two sleepy-eyed girls in the next line. They looked tired in their frilly prom dresses. Their skin was waxen, the sad, pale finish of moonlight. I knew. Oh, I hesitated a moment because I could see how a hasty eye might have thought them white, but I... New. Turning to Adolf, I whispered, Creole? And made giant, drunken nod in their direction. Adolf looked and confirmed it. They were, in fact, them. So this is how the legacy of the Creole begins. Here's the thing. 
those who self-identify as Creole, and I am not a Creole person, so I am not the sole authority on what it means to be Creole and who is and isn't a Creole. But Creoles are mostly understood as mixed race people, primarily from New Orleans, Louisiana, because that's where the term, you know, is originated from, who pass for white and who pass for white easily. We're not talking about, you know, people who look a little swirly, but you're not sure. Mm, mm, mm. No, we're talking about folks who, unless you have the eye, them folks is white. Okay? Them folks is white. And they were us. Black like us. I bet that virtually no one in the crowd had any trouble spotting the girl's African blood. And not only because we happen to be standing in an establishment that catered to black people, and not only because the girls did not look scared or determined not to look scared, as white girls in such situations usually want to. We all knew because we were all in some elusive sense of family. And family can, or imagines that it can, recognize itself, detect itself, see its own self no matter the guise. So when black people, and I would, and I would even argue for protection because it was to an extent, not everybody was doing it to protect themselves and people were doing it truly just to partake in the advantages of passing and absolutely never wanted to return back, you know, to being black or their black side. When black folks started adopting passing and started to pass themselves off as white to protect themselves. Most black people will tell you, we can always tell, we meeting black people, we can always tell when somebody's a little bit black. We just can. We can't. I don't care if you are blonde hair, blue eyes, pointy nosed, you look like just like the whitest of white women. If you have even one great, 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 great grandparent that's black, we can detect it. Because there's something, there's something about the coloring of the skin, right? There's something about the way the person moves about the world. There's something about the spirit, the attitude, the voice, the eye, the hair, There's always something that tips us off, black people, to the fact that this person, although they are passing as white into the white untrained eye, you should, there's no question, no doubt that this person is white. To us, we know you a little bit black. We know you are. We're not going to out you because we understand that you're protecting yourself in society, especially, you know, back in the 1800s, 1700s. Uh, early to mid 1900s, so we're talking about 1920, 30, 40, 50. We understand what you're doing, but we know you know that we know there's a look, there's an exchange that happens. I know you're black, I'm not gonna say nothing, but I see you because, as said in the essay, we all knew because we all were in some elusive sense family. Right? We're all each other. No matter how diluted bloodlines might get, we are all each other. And family can recognize itself, detect itself, see its own self, no matter the guys. So there stood the girls. Their tired, moonish looks telling us everything. Now I really eyed them and discerned the secret layer of brown just underneath the surface of their faces and arms. With practiced accuracy, my eyes took in the other hints. A certain weightiness of the hair, a broadness of lip, a fullness of hip and nose. When I was a child, it was something of a sport to fish for evidence of our presence, to seek ourselves in the faces of whites, such as Alexander Hamilton or Babe Ruth. Now, if y'all are unfamiliar, there's a really long history uh, especially with Babe Ruth, of him possibly being a more swirly man than he would care to admit. 
And this is because of his appearance. And I spoke about my early in my earlier videos that, you know, black people, we have a history, right, of not always being as forthcoming about lineages and where folks are from. And if you've never seen a picture of Babe Ruth, he looks like he could possibly be a mixed race man. You know, there's he has a broad lips. His skin color was quite swarthy, and swarthy is a really old school term for brown, like he had a dusky sort of skin tone. And people, you know, looked at him and said, I, you know, if I weren't careful, I would say that's a black man. Now, his hair texture was, you know, a little, it was straight, and he was able to get away with being a white man. And I say get away. Because we don't know for certain, we absolutely do not know for certain if Babe Ruth was fully white. And Babe Ruth also was aware that people were kind of questioning his lineage. And he never, Babe Ruth never really was like, I'm not. And he never said I was. He just would always sort of like laugh it off. But you could say this though, Babe Ruth is known for, you know, being in his times in the 1940s, right? Very kind to black folks. You know, he was on the right side of history often. So maybe, you know, there was a reason, an ancestral reason, right? A blood lineage reason that he felt that way. Each detail made plain the girl's blackness as surely as a look in the mirror and gave me the old sense of triumph until a moment passed and I remembered why we could never really be the same. We were in New Orleans and these girls were Creole and I am not. Adolph, you hold the key to this story. The reason you and I are family But you are on the other side of the Creole difference. A strange distinction made of nothing but stories and lies, lies and stories. The forces that conjure family. While you and I would both like to think of the Creole tale as one more plot line in the Black story, because that's all it really is, really. We both know that the true believers say Creole is a separate thing altogether. You and I know they say, look at us. How they say, watch us go. How they enjoy being them and not us. Now, this is a really, really important paragraph here. You know, there are many black folks, mixed race, lighter skinned, however you want to talk, you know, talk about it, who absolutely do revel in enjoying the fact that they are not like the rest of us, that they do have this proximity to whiteness and that it does afford them privileges that the rest of us will never have an access to simply because of the way we look. And it's a history that we have really not yet addressed as a community. I think a lot of the times we like to lean on the tragic mulatto and just think of like, oh, so sad, how so bad that people have these, you know, storied histories and past and there's a reason why they're mixed race and obviously it wasn't their choice, blah, blah, blah. You know, nobody asked to be here. We get born. I understand that. That's cool. But Once you are cognizant and aware of the fact that you are a mixed race person and that you do have privilege, I believe that it absolutely does become your responsibility to make sure that you are not using your privilege to continue to to perpetuate violence against those who are darker skinned and who are your ancestral family, right? Just because you can pass for white doesn't mean that you have any right to look down on me because guess what? At the end of the day, you still black. And if the white folks find out you're black... They're going to treat your black ass like the black person you are. Period. Them and us. How strange. I realize now that we have never talked about the differences in our looks. Your light and my dark. Neither of us, I suspect, has consciously avoided this discussion. It simply hasn't been an issue. There are so many things to talk about. Why waste time on such foolishness? But there it was. During the trip down home to New Orleans, there was a differences stuck in our faces. It broke our silence. Compels me to speak to the absurd. Let me first describe our looks with as cold as an eye as I would any character. 
I have chocolate brown skin, generous lips, the kind of ordinary kinky hair many black women still get mad at. I wear a goatee and sometimes glasses. I am 30 years old and I'm not in great shape because I don't like working out. You got a couple decades on me, but you're probably in better condition. I don't recall seeing too many gray hairs on your head last time I saw you, though your hairline is ebon. Your hair is straight and heavy like a South Asian's. Your skin is amber brown. Your features are round but strong. You've even been mistaken for a countryman by several natives of India. But you are black, definitely, and Creole. We've been friends for several years now, and though there is no explaining friendship, there are a few reasons I want you to know I see. We both love to watch people do their hustles. We laugh at the same absurdities and mostly get hurt by the same absurdities. We have similar politics and we aren't sellouts, which is not normal, which is why the sellouts call us cynics. There is a lot more, of course. The stories of people's affections are oceanic in number and complexity. And this way, we are very ordinary. But the subject at hand is the black and the brown. Surely, this is one of the stories that makes us up, as it makes up every other African American. And with any examination, every white or Asian or Latino or anybody else on these shores... Though we haven't talked about our own colors, you and I have talked about how much social meaning is attached to the shade difference, even today. You've lived it and tried to forget it because the debate is absurd. I don't like tracking that stuff inside either. I've cracked jokes about those confessional pieces describing the pain of being dark or the pain of being light or the pain of being mixed and in between, seldom as anything real said. We've laughed about how white people eat that stuff up, but for the moment, I will stop laughing because I've decided to put in mind that conflict between the black and the brown and to follow the story of the Creole. You know, the Creole is the direct descendant of the octoroon. The the terms are cousins. Octoroon is now a derogatory term. Please don't go around calling folks octoroons. You will get punched in the face. We're using it for historical analysis. Thank you. But the Creole and the octoroon are essentially the same. Creoles, typically when you go back in their lineage, lineage, people who who self-identify as being Creole, are usually one-eighth black. Right? There's usually that great, great, great grandparent that's black. And for some, there was a purposeful whitening out in the family, right? They purposely made sure not to marry black men or they purposely made sure not to marry black women. Not everyone did that, but some did. And that's important to mention because that's a part of our history. That's a part of our lineage. That's a part of our ancestry that we don't often like to discuss. And I'm discussing it because we need to. And I'm black and they black and we all black. So at the end of the day, if you're not white, you're black. And I want us to finally get that through our heads. Before this trip to New Orleans, I had never used the term Creole to describe Adolf. And I'm not certain that I'm comfortable with calling him one now. But his family would be considered Creole. And I guess that makes Adolf them. Even though he doesn't call himself one, and even though he always refers to the Creoles in third person, and nearly always with an edge of sarcasm. After I told him I was coming to New Orleans, Adolf offered to show me some of the Creole world. I knew he wasn't entirely comfortable with the role of native informant. He didn't do very much talking about them. Mostly he said cold, ironic things, and observed me observing them. When I returned from the city, I found a couple of the books that Adolf had suggested. White by Definition by Virginia Dominiques and Creole New Orleans, a collection of essays edited by Arnold Hirsch and Joseph Logstone. These and other books, articles, studies, interviews illuminated the social history of New Orleans and pointed me to other sources that were also helpful. But as I read, I began to sense a familiar silence and I realized that nearly every piece I found danced around the issue of how when precisely Black Creoles developed their peculiar consciousness of shade, I was forced to read very closely to fill in the holes myself. The bulk of the story, however, is thoroughly documented. Creoles began and begin as Criollo. 
the name African peoples enslaved by the New World Iberians in the 16th century gave to the Africans born here. The term did not remain in black hands for very long. Spaniards and Portuguese in the colonies soon took to calling themselves Criollo. So let's dissect. Creole begins as Criollo. This is the name that African peoples enslaved by New World Iberians in the 16th century gave to Africans born here. And then we have Spaniards. So folks from Spain, no African lineage, right? Spaniards and Portugueses, okay? People from Portugal in the colonies taking to calling themselves Criollo. Now, if you have, you know, some history or some context or Google, Spaniards and Portuguese, like in some Spaniards and some people from Portugal, some Portuguese people can be a bit on the darker side, right? The traditional Spanish look is dark hair, maybe more olive toned skin, you know, dark eyebrows, brown eyes. They're dark right? They're tan. They don't look like the French is what I'm trying to say. They don't look like the English. So, you know, it doesn't seem wild that they would take to calling themselves Criollo as well, because of course, although they don't look like the African, they, Spaniards and Portuguese also understand we don't look like the British and the French though. So we're also othered and we also look different. And yes, it has to do with skin tone. Okay. Digest it now. Digest it. Digest it. All right. Some of them even argue that the word exclusively indicated white nativeness and that only natives of pure European ancestry could use the term. Now, hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought Creole begins as Criollo was the name African peoples enslaved by New World Iberians in the 16th century gave to Africans born here. Now, how does the term Criollo start to mean white nativeness and that only white natives of pure European ancestry can use a term? Now, that's confusing. White people just want to steal everything, right? They, people can't have nothing. Anyway. The first appearance of Creole probably occurred in the late 16th century on the French island of St. Dominique, now called Haiti. Creole made its way to Louisiana soon after the territory's founding in 1682. Here it signified nativeness, plain and simple. French colony policy early on encouraged mixing with the Choctaw and other local peoples. Inevitably, there were plenty of interracial unions in the territory. The offsprings were called Creole. All locally born children shared the name. Children of the German Arcadians from Canada called Cajuns. Spanish occupiers, immigrants from Cuba and St. Dominique and other French Caribbean islands as well as French children of French arrivals. Okay, stop. Let's... Because now, hold on. We... we, What? Hold on. Okay. So, the first appearance of Creole probably occurred in the late 16th century on the French island of St. Dominique, now called Haiti. So the first time that we have ever seen the word Creole truly recorded and being used popularly is in the late 16th century in Haiti, formerly known as the French island of St. Dominique. So Creole makes its way to Louisiana soon after Louisiana is founded in 1682. So now... In 1682, Creole means, in Louisiana, in Louisiana only, it means native. Plain and simple. Creole, in 1682, signifies nativeness. Nothing else. Nothing else. If you're a Creole in 1682, it means you are a native person to Louisiana. That's it. You're a native person in the territory of Louisiana. That's what a Creole is in 1682. Understand that. Now, the French have occupied the land of Louisiana, claimed it as a territory in 1682, 
and the French colonial policy early on encourages mixing with the Choctaw and other local peoples. Because if we've learned anything in school, it's that people lived in America before white people came over here and do what white people do. So the French come over, they're in Louisiana, there's people already on the land. The French go, let's mix with these people. Let's have children with these people. Let's create families and unions with these people. So now you have an intermingling. You have a mixing. Now people are coming out looking all types of ways. But again, Creole, this term is being applied to anybody and everybody who's in Louisiana at the time in 1682. If you're born in Louisiana and it's 1682, 83, 84, 85, so on and so forth, You're a Creole because you are native to this territory. Okay, take it in. Take it in. The offspring were called Creole. All locally born children shared the name. Children of the Germans, Acadians from Canada, called Cajuns. Spanish occupiers, immigrants from Cuba and St. Dominique and other French Caribbean islands, as well as French children of French arrivals. Even African slaves who co-mingled with Indians as frequently as white did and mixed with the whites as well were permitted to identify their children with the term their forebears had invented. So again, everybody is a Creole (laughs) in Louisiana. That's what the French colonial policy stated. If you are on this land, it don't matter if you are from Canada, occasion. It don't matter if you are a Spanish occupier, if you are an immigrant from Cuba, if you are from any of the French Caribbean islands, if you are from Haiti, even if you are a French person who has a French wife, who has a French child, they are not mixed at all. Even if you are an African slave who commingled with the native people, even if you are an African slave who had a child with a white person, even if you are a, a, a half this and a half that and a half this and have a child with a half person, Everybody is allowed to call themselves a Creole. So Creole now takes on nationality, right? Creole is becoming a ethnicity. Creole is an ethnic group. That is how the term is starting to be used in 1682. Now, I know that all sounds nice and dandy and it makes it sound like, you know, Louisiana was a racial haven, but no. None of this, of course, should encourage the reader to think Louisiana as any sort of racial haven. Louisiana began as a white idea and it remained one. Choctaw kindnesses were repaid with genocide. Most Africans were shipped in as chattel slaves and Europeans walked the land as rulers, just as they did everywhere else. What did make Louisiana, and especially is its port city, New Orleans different from the English colonies or the eastern seaboard, was that it was understood in the way it understood race mixture. Though white Americans also had sex with Africans and Indians, they usually denied its result. Anyone with one drop of African blood was by the American scheme defined as black, and everyone else was effectively white. But remember, Louisiana is understanding race differently. Things were marginally more flexible in New Orleans. Concubinage facilitated by regular quadroon balls, where white men met and picked from a parade of mixed-race females and interracial plachiage, a form of common-law marriage, were tactically permitted until the turn of the 20th century. Children of these arrangements were frequently manumated. They and the people of Native American and partial Native American ancestry composed the overwhelming majority of class of people called gens de couleur, or colored people, and were recommendation of Louisiana's black codes formerly considered neither black nor white, but a third race. Okay. There we go. So see... Creoles understand themselves as not being black or white or being mixed or mulatto. They understand themselves as a third race. 
the way that we got black people, white people, the Mexican, Creole. Right? Creole. Because see, in other parts of the world, in pretty much every other state, <laughs> right, in America, when you are of mixed descent, when you are of mixed race, and and even more so, specifically when you are mixed black and white, you, there's confusion. You don't know if you should identify as black. You don't know if you should identify as white. You don't know if you should identify as biracial, mixed race, blah, 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 blah. In Louisiana, in New Orleans, there ain't no problem. There ain't no problem. You a Creole. You are a Creole. There's not, what do you mean you're black and white? What do you mean you're biracial? What do you mean you're mixed race? You're not, you're a Creole. That is its own race. Creole. Aha, you see? Gotta, gotta read sometimes. Gotta read. <laughs> New Orleans Chaparte racial order resembled that of many of the islands in the Caribbean. From Cuba to Haiti to Brazil to Jamaica, European settlers used the amount of white blood precipitile in black bodies as a measuring stick to distinguish among Africans, handing people with discernibly mixed ancestry more rights and privileges. Historians suggest the appearance of this logic usually corresponded to the ratio of black people to white owners. The higher the number, the higher the frequency of miscongestion. The more reason to embrace a third category. So here's the thing. Like today, it's more black folk than white folk. Okay? So, what do you do if you find yourself a white settler, right, in a land, and there are more people in this land who don't look like you, but somehow you have found yourself in a leadership position. But people can always uprise, right? People can always go against you. The Haitian Revolution. So you have to find a way to placate these people. You have to find a way to appease them. You have to find a way to keep the peace, but also keep your distance and maintain and uphold whiteness. You create a third race. You create a color system hierarchy. You create a skin tone hierarchy. You create a race hierarchy. You start to create all of these categories with certain rules and regulations so that people don't just, you know, get up in arms they don't have anything. Well, the mulatto feels better about themselves because they get this, that, and the third. The quadroon feels better about themselves because they're even closer to whiteness than the octoroon, hexteroon, until the family is essentially white because the black ancestry is so far back, it's obsolete. That was on purpose. That was tactful. And today in 2021, we're still trying to recover from this purposeful separation of people and familyhood and, and, and tribalness. Because at the end of the day, we all black. At the end of the day, no matter if you're a quadroon, octoroon, mulatto, biracial, creole, white people, when they go back to their house, they calling you black. And every little privilege that they've given you is just to keep you away from them and to make you feel good about yourself when you get in the bed. Because you still can't do everything they can, can you? No. You know why? Because you're not white. Hmm. Anyway. European settlers used this amount of white blood precipitile in black bodies as a measuring stick to distinguish among Africans, handing people with discernibly mixed ancestry more rights and privileges. Historians suggest the appearance of this logic usually corresponded to the ratio of black people to white owners. The higher the number, the higher the frequency of miscongestion. The more reason to embrace the third category. Jamaican slavers, for example, borrowed the Spanish nomenclature for their mixed race progeny. Alone among the English colonies, Jamaicans recognized legal differences among sambos and mulattoes, quadroons and octoroons. In New Orleans, these were the gens du coulier, the colored people. Their semi-official thirdness began to wane, however, when Thomas Jefferson authorized the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Americans flooded into New Orleans and old-time Creole residents initially reacted by reasserting their local heritage. Both colored and white Creoles continued to speak their gumbo French, patterned after the Creole spoken by Haitian Blacks. Prepare their gumbo dishes derived from the French, African, Indian, and Spanish cuisines, practice their Catholicism, and often 
its syncretic counterpart, hoodoo. Neither culture nor cultural nationalism would prove sufficient, however, to the stave off the political and economic onslaught of the U.S. by the 1850s. White Creoles had altered the way they used the name in order to fit the contours of American racial dualism. Jean Zoukaler was pushed into the Negro category, and Creole was said to refer only to white natives. The denials got louder as the Civil War approached, and even louder with the post-war enactment of the Jim Crow system. It may be possible to pin down precisely when Jean Zoukaler started to call themselves Creole. But the shift was well on the way when the Supreme Court handed down its landmark Plessy versus Ferguson decision in 1896. Homer Adolph Plessy, the plaintiff, was very light complexion, colored resident of New Orleans. In 1892, a group of eminent citizens of color, the Committee de Citoyen, selected him to test the separate car act passed two years earlier. On the 7th of June, Plessy tried sitting in a whites only coach and was denied entry. He was hauled to court where he claimed his entitlement to every right, privilege, and immunity secured to citizens of the white race. And he lost the vote, and he lost by a vote of seven to one. The court's ruling confirmed America's commitment to separate but equal. Separate but equal is an apartheid. And it implicably leveled distinctions between the traditionally free coloreds and the blacks they do. They derisively called Americans had penned all African descendants in the same caste, regardless of class, color, or prior condition of servitude. Dominique's white, by definition, notes that Louisiana lawmakers reinstituted old rules outlawing sexual unions between Negroes and whites a little more than a decade later. By 1910, legislators specifically classed together all persons of the colored or black race. In doing so, Louisiana either changed or noted the change in the meaning of colored. Now, colored people of Indian or partial Indian ancestry would legally be white. One drop of African blood made only made any colored person black. There weren't enough people of Asian background around to foul up this tidy dualism. And so it was finished. New Orleans harbored no more semi-official third races. So isn't that crazy how Louisiana, how New Orleans went to being more nuanced in its understanding of race and class to now being somewhat black and white, right? And I would even argue this goes to show how the American understanding and then even further the British truly understanding of race is really pervasive and it undercuts everything that any other place is doing. Um, You know, although things weren't perfect, the understanding of Creole and the giving of a third race did allow free blacks at that time in Louisiana and New Orleans to move about that place a bit more freely and to generate and create more things for themselves, which ultimately did also help those who weren't free blacks and even help those free blacks who were just of darker skin color. And it's important to note that these were French people. Like, of course, they weren't perfect. They're white. They're still racist. Like, they're still colorist. Like, it's still terrible things happening. But the way that the French were interpreting race and class, it was different from how the British and then how the white American was interpreting it. Because Thomas Jefferson is, a, like, that's a white American man. Right? That's a white American man. And when he does Louisiana Purchase and goes on to do other things politically, it influences so much change in New Orleans that they eliminate this third race completely. And whatever little progress had been made, just like that, it gets wiped away. Because of whiteness. Because of wanting to uphold whiteness. But I think that's interesting. And I don't know if people really discuss that. But like, look at how the French were operating in America when they settled the territory of Louisiana, again, still horrible, still racist, still colorist, still violent, like still terrible, terrible, terrible. But still, just the politics here. Let's just, sometimes we got to, just the politics here. How they were interpreting race 
and color and ethnicity and class was a bit more sophisticated and much more nuanced than the way that the white American was. So, you know, take that how you want. So suddenly the gens du colère find themselves invisible to the law. Not only had New Orleans whites denied their claim to Clio heritage, the state had officially robbed them of recognition of their relatively middle-class status as artisans and in few cases as members of polite society. Homo Adolf Plessy lived, I think, in their weird purgatory. This may be an injustice to him since he left almost no letters, notebooks, or any record of his thinking. Nor does purgatory seem like a residence for a man who legitimately can be thought of as the Rosa Parks of his day. The in-between zone inhibited by the Jones really had no name at all. Plessy is a Rosa Parks, both for blacks and these suddenly nameless people who began to call themselves Creole for a new reason. To hold on to their differences from Negroes. While many of the freedmen spoke Gumbu and also called themselves Creole, they were mostly of the countryside. And as such, were not real competitors for the term. And the assumption of the term Creole was not conducted in a particularly loud way. Many people who qualified for the designation rejected it. Some simply crossed the color line. Others embraced a Negro identity and were among the most progressive Black Reconstruction leaders. Between these extremes, however, lay a mean. It is the reason that Plessy's light complexion and his support amongst the colored committee mattered. The petition for the right of prohibition averred the petitioner was seven-eighths Caucasian and one-eighth African blood. That mixture of colored blood was not discernible in him and that he was entitled to every right, privilege, and immunity secured citizens of the United States of the white race. However perfectly Plessy's ambiguous environment matches the phenotypal differences of the Jones, how nearly indescribable the environment is, Plessy quietly says his looks put him outside the Negro race and render him ineligible for white privilege. It is off base to imagine a juror's concluding that the Jones should be extended certain privileges based on this middleness. Perhaps this was the Kumuti's secret hope. Yet all of the historians I read were careful not to go on about the shade consciousness as a historical force. Maybe they are being too polite or maybe they haven't the documentation to speak with any precision. The historians stress that the light dark distinction is a crude way of looking at New Orleans history. Jean Blasigny, for example, also reluctantly reports in Black New Orleans, 1860 to 1880, that social classes grew up around color primarily because Mulatto was a generally free man. 77% of the free Negroes in 1860 were mulattoes. And a Black man was almost always a slave. 74% of slaves in the 1860s were Black. In fact, color was closely correlated with status. 80% of all Blacks were slaves and 70% of all mulattoes were free men. So if you was light-skinned to did, you was free. If you was dark-skinned to did, you was a slave. He goes on to assure readers that class is a hidden issue and that color consciousness was more apparent than real. Surely he is right on the first count, but what can he possibly mean by real? I don't mean to pick on Mr. Vlasingme, but color was a real force in Reconstruction era New Orleans. The evidence is in the attitude for which Creoles have been known all century. Their scientific adherence to the skin color cultivation, their exclusive Mardi Gras balls, their light as a paper bag test for marriage and parties, their jelly roll more in crosstown condensation to Louis Armstrong. The theme of this culture can be heard in the bittersweet lilt of Homer at Homer Adolf Plessy's plea. Adolf. After you hit me to Plessy's whispered basal notes, I read the case again. I italicized the key line because I know we would have been able to discern the us in Homer Adolf Plessy, as we did those girls with the skin color of moonlight. And then I was struck with the odd fact that the poor Plessy shares a name with you. This coincidence can only be overdrawn, of course, but there it is, an obvious line of connection, conjured by the two syllables, a, dof, a, name, a, dof, a story. 
The tale incites me. It draws my hand and drags the rest along. Makes my brain note again the difference between your skin, your nose, your hair. The cruelness they once were supposedly to signify. How much of Plessy's love song shapes you? Obviously, I know a person does not have to be Creole to understand his ambivalence, but I also suspect it helps, if only because Creoles, by definition, have more claim to the tale. My question, it noises up the silence you and I have been maintaining, but let me force your hand for a moment. One way to watch their attitude and action, you said, is to crack open a Creole friend's family photo album. Their family might show you the family photos from two generations ago, and you spot a shot of an elderly woman with African features and brown skin. And when you ask who she was, the friend would probably deny knowing her. You did the dialogue. What do you mean I don't know who she is? You know that's your grandma. No, it's not. So who's this white man? A friend. A friend? You know that's your grandpa. We laughed at that. Many Creoles would not admit it, you said, but because the white man probably had not acknowledged the others in the photo, which means that the family was technically illegitimate. Growing up in New Orleans, you told me later, it would be impossible to see race as anything but socially constructed, but that does not mean it's not real. For the better part of the century, Creole Blacks in New Orleans retold and retooled the third race concept denied to them by American tradition. They invented an ethnic group distinguishing themselves from other light-skinned middle classes in America by their intense devotion to the plan. The visible signals, Plessy's mixture of colored blood not discernible. These were the basic ways to tell one's people from people who were not. Family were the visible ones, the ones with whom you constructed your social networks, your family, your identity. You are definitely visible to the Creoles. I know the details of your family's history might at first glance seem to obscure you to them. Your grandpa was Cuban and he used to speak Cuban Spanish and you and he and the rest of the family are really of New Orleans solo. I know too that your Amber Brown was considered too dark for at least one party, that at least one Creole doorkeeper told you the paper bag and said no. But I also know that no one fits any family template precisely. You and the rest of us are a mess of stories. And besides, the Creole story is fading even as I write, getting less and less real, fluttering away. And the physical signals that kept you in the photos are shifting meaning. Still, you're the key to the story. Not because of who you are, but because of how you are still perceived. Adolf wanted a little sentimentally to make sure I visited the old haunt he'd been praising, Mouris. It's located on one of the seven's many quiet corners and has plain looks. Some simple chairs and tables, three gambling machines, and a Sunday afternoon yellow light, the color of old newspapers. We chose not to sit at the long, old-fashioned counter because there were too many of us. Instead, we put together several tables while Adolf told us how Fats Domino used to park outside and how everything on the menu was good. To believers, Mule is one of the places where creoleness can be located, caught, taken like wild game. I entered as a skeptic, but I couldn't help wanting to taste the culture. I had the gumbo. I tried my friend Gian's trout po' boy. I sampled some of Adolf ro Oyster's roll. The food slipped down with simple gravity of blood and Adolf drew family pictures on the cave wall. He told how his father used to take him to drink there years ago. He chatted about the color of Fat's Cadillac. And then he said to Allison, a friend, there's your uncle. Pointing out a yellow guy sitting at the counter with hooded eyes and long silver hair. Alice and his family. Stop, she said, laughing, her eyes coolly measuring the yellow man. Stop. After the meal, we took a tour of the neighborhood. It was the middle of the weekday, and most everybody who was employed was away. Not too long ago, an average working resident of the 7th was an artisan. The neighborhood remains working class, but these days, many of the people who know the ward best are middle class beneficiaries of affirmative action, like Allison. She worked with the municipal administration and grew up in a nearby subdivision, spending a lot of time in the area as a child. I know you're going to be sensitive when you write about this, she told me without blinking. Then you understand I mean New Orleans when I say us. As we walked, Allison and Adolph reminisced. Janine and the rest of the group played audience. I left their private narratives to take in some dark green shade trees and pastel colors. 
squatting houses with big windows and small porches. Old women with pale skin sat in wired chairs looking light as dust, watching things crumble. They seemed to say the crumbling wasn't something where people had done. When the Jeans du Kélère seized Creole in the start of the century, descendants of white Creoles all but stopped using the name. Mostly because its hint of miscongestion would not go away. But then, use of French and Gombo were on the way in too, since America had won the culture war. Allison was pointing out which of the houses were pressing and which of the houses we were passing were Creole cottages. They looked like the other homes, except they have annexes out back. Allison said the family matriarch and patriarch would live in the main house, and maybe her daughter would get married and move into the annex. Family would be all around. Two blocks past Mules, we stopped in front of a Corpus Christi church, one of the largest black parishes in the nation. The church also runs grammar school, one of several in the area where many Creole parents still send their children. Adolf started putting down St. Augustine, a favorite high school, and talking up his own alma mater, Xavier Prep, another favorite one. However small I thought the larger Creole family is and how plainly the church is in its blood, Allison remembers how her grandfather and grandmother used to bless a lot of bread. And now sometimes she finds herself making a cross in the air before she cuts a slice. She also tells a story about an elder she knows who was asked by a black ecclesiastical council to come meet the Pope. I'm not black, he said, and refused to go. For most of this century, Creole more or less effectively walled off the Negroes, but the civil rights movement changed everything. Africanness became beautiful. Negroes secured voting rights and subsequently promises of affirmative action. When Creole children took to calling themselves black, the wall cracked wide. We turned more corners and found ourselves in front of the headquarters of former Mayor Sidney Barthelme's Community Organization for Urban Politics, COOP. It is built of plain cinder block with no frills with a nondescript sign staring out above a single door. It has the look of a political clubhouse in the old and effective and regular sense. Adolf and Allison started talking about the election and about Mark Morrell, the brand new mayor. I'd seen his cypress eyes gazing dimly from poles, newsstands, building walls all over the city. And I'd wondered how precisely his straight hair and his skin color had helped him win. All three non-white mayors New Orleans have elected have been called Creole. The first was Mark's father, Ernest Dutch Morel, an aggressive proponent of pan-black coincidence. His successor was much more traditional Creole, and his coup organization played a big role both times he won office. Only close observers of New Orleans politics can say with much precision how being Creole helped these men. But it's pretty clear that young Creoles were in the best position of any black people to take advantage of the post-60s affirmative blackness. To a great extent, this was a matter of class, the vestigial advantage they had enjoyed since slavery. Creoles worked the right job, went to the right school, attended the right affairs. Creole politicals were also family to the people in the coup and its forerunners the best organized non-white political machines in New Orleans, nearly always based in the 7th. Some of the more progressive public figures during the civil rights upheaval were, of course, men and women of Creole background, such as Dutch Morrell. But there was always an ambiguity in their activism. Like Plessy and his redemption-era comrades, Creole progressives in the 60s ran the show. The leading Black reform organization of the civil rights period, in fact, was self-consciously named the Citizens Committee after Plessy's Comment de Citon. The name was a nod to the non-Creole Blacks and their emerging political demands, but it also indicates who was in a position to reach out to whom. Now, non-Creole demands would seem to have won out. Public claims to a racial thirdness would ruin the chance of any candidate in the eye of Black or even white voters. Sent and scant few of whom still try to retain the rights to Creole. Not even home, homeboy Bartholomew would dare shout out his Creoleness. We walked on as Adolf and Allison continued talking and laughing, and Gianne and the group continued playing audience. I privately finished the thoughts the pale women had inspired a few minutes ago. Creole has become a set of meals and prayers and words, feverishly pushed through the lips like an old password.
The Census Bureau presently puts American residents to four racial boxes, white, black, or Negro, Asian and Pacific Islander, and American Indian and Alaska Native. There's a box for people in these categories who want to identify themselves as Hispanic, for example, black Hispanic or white Hispanics. This is also a box labeled other. None of these labels can possibly account for the vast ethnic variety within each category. Arabs share white with people from Argentina and Norway. Natives of India share Asian with Japan's Anu and Jamaica's Chinese. And as a result, each category is being contested from within subgroups who feel misplaced. Today, one of the loudest of these subgroups proposes a new category, multiracial, for people of racially mixed ancestry. Multiracial has the potential to explode the black and white dichotomy that underwrites American thinking on race. This thinking, of course, depends on a potent fallacy, namely that race is a biological reality more or less reflected in appearance. One is given race by one's biological parents. One's race can also be determined by close examination of their hair, nose, etc. It is no secret that most African and Native Americans are, by application of such race logic, mixed race. It is also true that many white Americans have some African or Indian ancestry. Most Latinos are mestizo of Native American, European, African, and often Asian heritage. Many Asians, the fastest growing ethnic group of the New Americas, marry outside of their race. 38% of Japanese American women do, for example. A large and rising portion of America could, on the basis of these facts, legitimately claim ancestry from two or more racial groups. As soon choose identif- the identity and soon choose to identify as biracial or multiracial. Y'all, I'm drinking wine. Mind your business. Mulatto was used as a census category until 1920, but it functioned primarily as a biological description and to some extent an indication of class, not as the radical maker of difference suggested by black and white. With several isolated exceptions, most notably Southern Louisiana, no third racial category with comparable political significances have ever existed on these shores. Both Native American and Asian describe peoples who have been considered with some ambivalence outside white American civilization, as pre in the former case and as strangers in the latter. Africans, while also outsiders, have long been considered of the society, a result of their status as slaves. The record of this dialect is embedded in the common tongue, racial or race, have come to signify. For most Americans, black. This is especially true in today's neo-redemptive climate. Read the New York Times or social text. Tune into WABC or WBAI. Watch the reports on CNN or ABC or CBS and listen closely when the nation's leaders discuss race. The concept remains one of several stigmatized peculiar to blackness despite the rapid growth of various non-African colored populations, especially out West. And despite today's fashionable nostalgia for the late 60s black pride, despite these trends, most people who think they have a choice Avoid the stigma at all costs. So we're going to end today's video here. We're not done. The conversation is going to continue with the part two. But I wanted to leave you all right here because I really want you guys to sit with to sit with all that we've learned today. And look at how quickly it took for a place that was, again, very nuanced in its understanding of race to succumb to white America's messed up logic of race. I'm not saying it was right to have a a third category of Creole and to put them on pedestals, but at least there was a recognition and acknowledgement that folks are not just black or white and there's something to say about that and it should be acknowledged. Now, should that acknowledgement come with privileges and make those who are just black feel lesser than? No. I'm not saying that, no. But to acknowledge it was progress nonetheless, even if it was, you know, coupled with a little racism, colorism, texturism, featurism, it was still progress. Progress is messy too, you know. Progress is messy. It's not just going to be perfect and cute and beautiful and wrapped up in a bow all the time. Sometimes progress is very messy, but we have to take steps to get anywhere, don't we? So, you know, um, I hope you enjoyed today's video. 
I am going to continue with part two. We're going to finish reading this article. I'm going to finish responding to it. And I want to know your comments down below. Tell me your thoughts. How are you feeling now? How are you feeling?